Guys, Silicon Valley Bank went from being only insured for $250,000 per account to having unlimited insurance based on the whims of the Fed. So if the Fed could just snap their fingers and have unlimited insurance for that bank, are they going to do it for all the banks? That is the story being passed around that if they can do it for them, what about doing unlimited insurance if need be for all the banks? So let's take a look at what that would look like, what it would entail, and how plausible it is to actually do this. And just remember, you can't believe anything coming out of the mouth of the Fed because they lie constantly. They change what they said from one day to the other, and then they're going to gaslight you saying that they didn't even say that. So let's start off with that first. So let's start off with this first lie from 2017 when Janet Yellen said she expects no new financial crisis in our lifetimes. So either she was lying or she did not expect to live another six years. So Zero Hedge is highlighting here the language that she changed out of her prepared speech from yesterday that caused the market to crash. Now they are changing it. This is like a move right out of the book 1984 where they go back and change the news. So just yesterday, as I said last week, the U.S. banking system is sound. The federal government's recent actions have demonstrated our resolute commitment to take the necessary steps to ensure that depositors' savings remain safe. The market didn't like that yesterday, so now they changed it to... As I have said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion, and they are tools we could use again. The strong actions we have taken ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. Certainly, we would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. And so you can actually see that testimony at the U.S. Department of Treasuries, March 22, 2023. All right, look at these paragraphs. Chairman Van Hollen, two years into this administration, our top priority, we took actions to protect, blah, blah, blah. As I said last week, the U.S. banking system is sound. One day later, what does that paragraph look like? March 23rd, Chairman Womack, two years into this administration, our top priority, we took actions to protect all depositors. Uh-oh. As I have said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion. And they are tools we could use again, blah, blah, blah. So what's missing? The U.S. banking system is sound. So why did they take that out? I don't know, but that probably spooked a lot of people that they would take that out. And so they change it to Americans' deposits are safe. We would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. And so that is meant to imply that they may have more insurance, FDIC insurance, or even unlimited insurance, however the hell that would work. And so Zero Hedge has this article, the math behind deposit insurance and why it's the beginning of the end. So on Tuesday, Yellen said the U.S. could repeat its actions if other banks became imperiled. She was referring to smaller lenders and denied the next day that insurance would be, quote, blanket. But given the regulatory direction of travel over the last 40 years, this will inevitably apply to any lender when push comes to shove. So over the weekend, a coalition of mid-sized U.S. banks asked federal regulators to extend FDIC deposit insurance for the next two years so as to alleviate any fears which could result in a wider deposit run on regional and community banks. So let's look at the actual numbers here. First of all, there's $18 trillion in U.S. deposits. Of that, about $11 trillion or so are currently insured by the FDIC. And Bank of America strategist Mark Cabana says deposit insurance can be done in a variety of ways. One, all domestic bank deposits. Two, increase coverage to a higher amount versus the 250K currently. But if they extend the coverage to a higher amount, it would impact the reserves held in the deposit insurance fund. This is the fund used to bail out failed banks. 
And so the purpose of the DIF is to insure the deposits and protect the depositors of insured banks and to resolve failed banks. But the DIF is really just like the deductible on your car insurance. If your car is crashed, you might have a $500 deductible and then the insurance company pays the rest. If all the banks crash, the DIF will pay out what they can, like the deductible. But at the end of the day, it is up to the U.S. government to backstop the rest. But here's the problem. The DIF reserve ratio is 1.27%. In other words, they have $128 billion as of December 31st, 2022, to cover those $11 trillion in insured deposits. And the FDIC was aiming to increase the reserve ratio to 1.35 by September 2028. Uh, yeah, big deal. What's that going to do? That is not even a drop in the ocean. So here they say, even if they had that 1.35% target reserve ratio applied to the other uninsured deposits, the other $7 trillion or so, that would imply a reserve build of another $104 billion on top of what the reserves already are. Now, how do they get that money? Well, it comes from all of the banks. They chip in to buy this insurance. And so let's look at what this portion is compared to the net income across all FDIC insured banks. That is only... 263 billion for 2022. So if all the banks had to chip in to bring up another 104 billion for this additional reserves, that would be about 40% of all of the bank's profits for 2022. Now, obviously they wouldn't do it over one year. It would happen over several years. And so assuming this additional assessment is spread over 10 years, it implies an approximately 50 basis point drag on return on equity for the industry. Uh, some of these banks may not be around in 10 weeks, let alone 10 years. And so it says the DIF is never really supposed to be used. It's just to serve as a confidence booster. After all, even if they had 230 billion, that would be insufficient to bail out the uninsured depositors of even a huge bank like JP Morgan. Now, obviously $18 trillion in deposits is not gonna go up in smoke overnight. The banks have assets against it like bonds and all of that stuff, but a lot of those are showing some losses, but it's not anything close to $18 trillion. So is any of this a viable option? Mark Cabana is optimistic and says this is one way to address sensitivity among deposit customers, but it doesn't really address the main reason why depositors are fleeing, and that's because they are getting much better yields in money market funds or treasury bills. And so he says, we believe the last few days have introduced investors, banks, policymakers to the new risks of deposit runs in the age of social media. We believe that absence a change to deposit insurance coverage so the $250,000 limit for big corporations means nothing. And so they are going to move their money to more banks that they think are less risky, like the JP Morgans at the expense of the smaller regional banks. And so this is a chart of what happens after the Glass-Steagall Act, which allowed the Fed to accept a wider basket of collateral, in other words, cheaper worse assets, more riskier assets. So their balance sheet reserves gold plus legal tender notes as a percent of total assets on this side here. And the dollars value purchasing power of consumer dollar based off the CPI with 1967 equals one on the left hand side. So you see they are highly correlated. And as the Fed balance sheet reserves diminishes, so does the purchasing power of a dollar. So what this says is if the Fed bails out all these banks and puts all of their riskier loans on their balance sheet, what do you think is going to happen to the purchasing power of your dollar? <laughs> uh, it's going to go even lower than it is here. 
And so in SVB's case, they had U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities that were underwater on their balance sheet, and the Fed took those underwater securities back and gave them loans at the full par value through their bank term funding program. But not all banks have these kinds of higher quality collateral. And so only a fifth of small banks' assets are currently shiftable onto the Fed's balance sheet, less than for larger lenders, leaving them considerably exposed. And so this is the difference between small banks and large banks, U.S. Treasuries and agency debt as a percent of assets. So the large banks have about 35% of their assets in U.S. Treasuries and agencies, which they can swap out with the Fed for new loans, while smaller banks have only about 20% of their assets in U.S. Treasuries and agencies. And so what is the other 80% of these banks' assets? Uh, maybe a lot of things like commercial real estate and office building loans and things like that. So not that great. So as the economy slows, asset prices fall and delinquencies and bankruptcy rise, especially in commercial real estate where small banks also happen to be the biggest lenders. So the outcome is the Fed will increasingly have to accept poorer quality collateral like they did during the pandemic when they bought all of the corporate debt, even junk rated companies. And that's when gold and Bitcoin started soaring. So this is where we are heading as a lot of these commercial real estates are not at full occupancy because of people working from home and their loans start to roll over at higher interest rates, these banks are going to have a lot of non-performing real estate loans on their books. Big depositors are continuing to flee to the bigger banks like JP Morgan, and so these smaller banks might have a big problem. And so that is going to force the Fed to take a lot of these junkier loans onto their balance sheet and give them par value for what they're taking in. And this is what happened during the great financial crisis. So they took in a lot of these loans that were underwater by 20, 30% and gave them new loans at par value with the collateral of this underwater debt. And so when this kind of thing happens, this is where you get moral hazard. So the banks are not stupid. They see that, hey, we know that if we all fail at once, the Fed has to bail us out. And so all we have to do is do some of the most riskiest investments we could to make as much interest as we can. And if it works out, great, we get to keep the money. If it doesn't work out and blows up and goes underwater, we take those bonds and we give them back to the Fed and they give us new loans for 100% of what we loaned out. Imagine you were playing a video game where you were a banker in a video game. And in the video game, you gave out loans and the riskier loans you gave out, the higher interest rate you would make. And all of the money that you make in that video game, you get to keep in real life. You cash it out into real money. But if you go bankrupt in the video game, all you have to do is press the reset button and you get to start playing the game again. What would you do? So this is where we are, guys. Don't expect the government to come and save you. You see, they make up one story one day, another story the next day. They can't even keep their lies straight. If you haven't done so already, you should diversify your money in different bank and brokerage accounts. And you should also have some precious metal when the S hits the fan. Nobody knows how this is going to play out, but... If the great financial crisis is any guide, you can be sure they will bail out their rich friends on Wall Street and in the banks before they bail you out. So plan accordingly.